Okay, so in this lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about TCP and UDP programming. So I'm going to say a little bit about sockets, then explain how to do TCP programming, and a little bit about UDP programming. And obviously, this is a link to your second mini projects, um, which would be an online game implemented, you know, using. I recommend that you implement them using TCP or UDP or combination of. Um, but uh, as I said, there's other technologies I'm teaching in this in the spring term, which you could also use. But this is this is the easiest and most straightforward way of implementing them. Okay, so sockets. Um, so we've got TCP sockets. So we talked about some talks about what a socket point socket is um, in the previous previous term. A socket's like a an endpoint of communication uh, between two programs. And you get uh, two kinds of sockets I'm going to talk about here, which are TCP sockets and UDP sockets. So TCP are reliable, they're duplex, you can talk in both directions. You have persistent connections, I connect to the server, and that connection remains, remains open until we close it or one of them falls over and dies. And there's a message order, so message one, send a message, and send a second message. The ordering of those messages will be guaranteed over TCP. And you can also work with streams of data, so I can write streams to this. TCP socket and then read them from the other end. UDP is, is a sort of packet, packet or datagram um, based protocol. Um, it's less reliable. You just fire off the packet, hope it gets there. You can do broadcast. Um, so I think Ginny you talk about later in this term uses this broadcast facility um, for web for services to announce their presence. There's no guarantee of message order. And as I said, it works with packets or datagrams. Um, in, so, um, from a game's point of view, you have this packet throttling thing that I covered uh, last term. So on 3G and Wi-Fi, if, you, if packets are lost, um, if you, you really want them to be sent immediately. If you're playing an online game, you want minimum lag, right? But there's a thing called TCP congestion control, so that when the network's really clogged, it waits a little bit uh, before resending the packet, presumably to reduce uh, the congestion. But this can introduce delays of maybe a thousand milliseconds. So for get, from the point of view of implementing a real-time game, TCP has its problems. So on UDP, you don't have this problem, but then you've got to implement your reliability and persistent connections in some other way, in some game-specific way. So the choice of TCP or UDP depends on what you want to do. So I've explained, you know, this is just a slide from that lecture on get online games. So World of Warcraft, you know, it hides the latency because of the nature of the game. The, the, the fact that occasionally you're going to get a thousand milliseconds delay doesn't matter because there aren't player-to-player -player collisions, only environmental-to-player collisions, which you can do on the local game engine, and the attacks aren't you know delicate sword play with exact position, position calculations. It's more like I think more like Dungeons and Dragons, I think, where you kind of attack an entity or cast a spell. So if your game is a sort of time-critical game, then you probably want to use UDP. But if it's a sort of more of a strategy game, turn-taking game, you probably want to use TCP and just use the built-in mechanisms for reliability and persistent connections that TCP gives you. So not the next lecture, but I think lecture after that, somewhere around then. So I'm going to give you some examples of game architectures. I'm going to explain how you can build online games using TCP and UDP. And it'll be mostly the turn-taking stuff will be TCP, but I'll also show you how you can build a real-time interactions game uh, using UDP, a very simple one. So I said, TCP is easiest choice because of persistent connections, work with streams, easy to send, like, write um, serializable objects to, uh, to streams to the TCP and then read it from the, read it from the connection. Um, but, it, you know, racing games, um, the, in a racing game, maybe the timing is going to be more critical, so maybe you want to use UDP. But you can also use a combination of TCP and UDP you can use TCP to set up the game and then UDP for the real-time interactions. And I'm going to give you an example of that um, in a later lecture. So the ports um, are an address on a particular computer. And co connections are routed to a combination of an IP address and a port. So you have so TCP and UDP are port-to-port -port connections, ports ranging from 0 to 65535. And each computer has these kind of entities called ports. And you connect to a particular port on a computer. And then the IP part of it is the internet protocol, the routing of the packet over the internet to that port on that computer. And you've got to remember, ports are not to 1023 are system ports, so don't 
it's rec I wouldn't recommend that you use these ports. Just pick something sort of a bit arbitrary, and I'll explain how you can deal with port conflicts uh, a little bit later. So sockets are the endpoint of communication link between two programs. Sockets bound to a particular port and accept connection requests on that port, and you can't bind to a port that's already in use. So this is why I recommended you stick to 0 to 1 and 2, 3 for system ports. Uh, avoid, sorry, um, this range of ports because these might be in use already. So you want to find a port that's not in use, or you're going to get a, an error, which I'll explain as I said. So, you know, think of a socket as, uh, yeah, as a socket. You sort of connect to the socket. Your connection is linked to that socket. It's all sort of, you know, all abstract, you know, ways of um, thinking about how, how it, um, it's all a kind of layer of abstraction put on top of what's really happening in a computer, but it's a very convenient one, and that's, and that's how networking is thought about. Okay, so that's TCP, UDP, sockets. So what we want to do now is work out how we can, in Java, write a program that can uh, use sockets to talk to another program running on a different computer or on the same computer. So first thing we're going to talk about is TCP socket programming. So Java has this nice class called a server socket that listens for connections on the server. So we, we got two, we've got to have a program like running on the server that listens for a connection on a particular port. And then our client's going to connect to that program on that port. And then once they've connected, we can then write, read and write to and from the two sockets and, and communicate between the programs. So we create the server socket here, the new server socket, import these libraries to make it work. And the first thing we need to deal with is what kind of address we're going to have, because the server socket's going to listen on a particular port, or it's going to listen on a combination of an address or port. So we need to use this Java uh, inet address class. We need to create a new ad inet address, so we can create it by name. So this could be like a local host, or it could be an IP address. And then we can create the server socket with a particular port number. I um, don't know what the 50 is, but then a, and a particular uh, internet address. So in this way, if we want to talk, but uh, communicate between computers, then the server needs to listen on like the IP address of the computer. If we want to just listen, and if we want to just communicate between separate programs running on the same computer, then we can just use localhost or omit that entirely. So yeah, to communicate between machines, we need to listen to the IP address. So in this case, we'd have, uh, this is like the IP address of the machine, 1.102.168.1254. So if we listen on that, so on that address, then any other program in the same local area network, ignoring the firewall problems, can then uh, communicate with that particular program listening on that particular port. So if you want to listen on a particular IP address, you need to find the IP address of your machine. So the easiest way of doing this is on the uh, Windows PowerShell. So this is just uh, all on the equivalent Linux or Mac OS shell. So you launch the PowerShell, and on Windows, you just type uh, IP config, and then that'll give you uh, the various uh, addresses. So this is my IP version 4 address. So this is 10, 3, 2, 1, 6, 26. This is like when you have the Wi-Fi address. Um, so if I just listen on that, uh, then, um, then our other computers that are running on the same Wi-Fi network um, will be able to reach me. In Linux, I think it's IF config for some reason, but you know it gives you the same information. There's other ways of getting it, but that's probably the easiest way. Okay, so we've got the IP address of the machine, we've got our server socket, and we're listening on the, um, the particular port on a particular IP address. And then we just sit there doing server socket dot accept. Now this is a blocking call, um, and later in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about threads, and I can combine threads with uh, TCP and UDP programming so that your program can do other things than just sit there waiting for connections. So this is a blocking call, and when, when a client connects, it returns a client socket. So now we've got a server socket and a client socket, and we can use these two things to communicate with the client. We can use the client socket to talk to the client, sorry. And then we can call server socket again, except to get another client socket that's connected to another client. So, got a client socket. This is used... Uh, um, so yeah, so now it's now the server side. We've got our socket. We can talk to the client. Now this is on the client side. We now need to on the client side. We now need to what's the code we need to use to connect to that server that we just created? Well, here we just have a socket. It's not called a server socket. It's just a regular socket. Um, so we just create a new socket again, linked to a particular um, address. So this could be localhost or IP address. Um, and I and this will then. Um, as long as the server exists, it will connect to the server and we'll have a socket. 
So now we've got our server socket, we've got a client socket, we've got, sorry, we've got a client socket on the server side and a socket here, and these two sockets can now communicate. And you can read and write to them using uh, input or output streams. So for example, here we've got the client socket, which, which uh, happened when the server accepted the connection, and we can get an output stream from there, and we can input stream and get an input stream as well. So we can uh, read from the client socket using the output stream and write to the socket um, using the input stream. Oh, sorry, it's the other way around. So this is the output from the server to the client, and this is the input uh, from the client. So it's reading data from the client and writing data to the client here. And on the client side, um, we get an output stream um, that enables the client to write data to the server, and then we've got an input stream that enables the client to read data from the server. All this input and output business gets a bit confusing, but I'll give you some code and you know, it'll, it'll all make sense. So we won't stress about it too much. So what we've got here, we've got our output streams and input streams. And in Java, these are fairly useless. You need to wrap them in something else. Um, you have this sort of multi-wrapping within wraps and in wrapping. It all gets a bit complicated. But we can wrap them in different ways in order to read, write, read and write different kinds of data. So if we want to read, uh, we could wrap them in a data input stream to read booleans, bytes, chars, doubles, floats, and so on. To do that, we create a new data input stream and pass in its constructor the socket, imp the input stream, and then we can like read int, or whatever, and we can do the same with a data output stream and write booleans, bytes, chars, doubles, and so on. We can use a print writer. Um, so again, we can use a print writer to wrap the output stream, and then we can do like things like out print line, which is similar to system.out.println, and we can use a buffered reader on the input stream, um, and that enable us to do uh, like read single character, read a line of text and tells us whether the stream's ready, ready or not. So, these, so we need to sort of wrap the, street, the input and output stream using these other Java classes to be able to do useful and easy operations with them. The one that I like the most is this object input stream and object output stream. So again, we're just wrapping the output stream in an object output stream or wrapping the input stream in an object input stream. And these object input stream and object output stream enable us to send and receive objects. So, uh, and I'll explain how to do that now. So this ability in Java to send and receive objects is extremely handy because if we, if we uh, create what's called a serializable object, and we can just write that to the socket, and at the other end, um, the server or the client can read that object and then just manipulate it just as if it was a local object. To make all that work, um, we need a, what's called a serializable interface. We need a serializable class because it's the serializable classes can be stored in a file or sent across a socket. And once we've got a serializable class, we can write it to input streams and read from output streams, files, and so on. Now, in a serializable class, it must implement the, the interface java.io.serializable, and the vari variables in the class must also be serializable. So the class must be serializable and the variables in the class, and then Java will do all the hard work of like writing that class to, to bytes, converting that byte into by the class into bytes, sending those bytes over the network or writing into a file. If, you if your class does contain variables that are not serializable, you have to mark them as transient or the whole thing will just fall over and die. You get this java.io.notserializable exception if you try to send a non-serializable class to an object output or an input stream. So just to re recap that, so we want to use object input streams, object output streams to write classes um, to the sockets and read classes from the sockets. So for example, we could um, send them. I'm going to explain later how we can talk about send a message object and read a message object. So we can send messages as objects rather than as t strings or whatever. So we want to write a class to the input stream, read it from the output stream. Yeah, but we can only do that with serializable classes. And these are the requirements for a serializable class, serializable class that implements this interface. And all the variables must be either serializable themselves or marked as transient. So this is a little bit of an example. So here, this is a serializable message class, be the sort of thing you might want to send between the client and the server. So here we have public class message. So implements java.io.serializable, or if you import java.io.serializable, you can just talk about it, it implementing serializable. So the message class is implements the serializable interface, and then all of these, um, all of the variables in the class must themselves be serializable. So in this case, it's no problem. We just got integer and a string. Both of these are serializable, so that's the class done. That's a serializable class. I could read and write that from a socket, no problem. 
But if we have a class here called my class that's not serializable, um, then we've got a problem. If we try and write that to a socket, we're going to get a not serializable error. So what we need to do is mark this class as transient. If we mark this class as transient, we can uh, read and write it from a socket, no problem. But the limitation of this is that when I, um, that it'll be probably a null pointer or something like that um, when I read it at the other end. So all of the data structures in this class won't be copied um, or won't be accessible or copied or whatever or sent over the network um, if we mark it as transient. What we really want to do is ensure that this class also implements serializable so that the entire thing can be sent across. Otherwise, we're going to get some errors because maybe this method here you know, accesses my class in some way, and that's all just going to break when we read it at the other end if we mark it as transient. So to, to use this serializable, once you, you know, once you sort of understand roughly how it works, it becomes very easy to use. So we create a new message. So this message class is a serializable class. So if we want to send a message to the server, we just create a new message with the message type and the string. Then we just create an object output stream by wrapping the output stream. And then we just write the object to the stream. Dead easy. And on the server side, to receive the serializable objects, we just create this object input stream. And then we just read the object, cast it as, uh, as a message object. So we need to, this is like interpreting the object as a message and it becomes a message. And then we can just call methods, the various methods on the message, such as message to string or message get type or whatever message whatever methods we put in the objects. It's very, once we've got our objects serializable, it's very easy to send objects between uh, clients and servers. And so it's kind of a lot easier, I find, than messing around sending strings or integers uh, as your messages. So now I'm going to talk through a very simple TCP client and a very simple TCP server, give you a little demo, just explain how it all works. So, so this is all just sort of, you've got all this code uh, on the class website, so I'm just going to talk through the sort of core bits of it. So we first we get our host address, so this is the client side. Um, create a socket, when that returns, we're gonna have our socket here, and we can get the output stream from that, and we can get an input and a buffered reader, so we can, so we can uh, write, write data to the server and read data from the server. And what we do is you use the output stream to say hello from client, and that's sent over to the server, and then we read in a response from the server. And here's the server, so again, you've got the code there, so just focus on the core functionality. So we uh, get a host address, um, create a server socket, listen on that, blocking call, returns as a client socket, we get the input and output streams um, from the client socket, and then we read the, read the messages that are sent from the client, and then echo them back to the client. And we can use this internet address, if we want to know who's connected to us uh, on the, on the Server side, we can use this get internet address or get host name or get host address. So if you want to know who's connected, you can find out the full details there. So uh, how do we run them? Well, I typically, uh, two ways in which you can run these things. We need two main methods. So we've got two classes here. We've got a server class and a client class. So we can't just press the green button in NetBeans because we've got to run two separate classes. Um, so you can run them separately from the command line or in this case, I'm just going to show you how to run them in NetBeans. So we need to run them, a separate, run them separately rather than running them. Um, I'll explain this a little bit. Yeah, I'll do the demo first and talk about the output. All right, so, so if you look at these, so this is the very simplest one. So here's a simple TCP server. Yeah, come on. All right, so this is all the code I just talked about with the server. Now, we can't just press play because we've got like each of these has a separate main method. So what we need to do is right click here and run file, and that will start up the server. And do that, so that's sitting there, waiting to a blocking call on uh, here. It's waiting here to, to receive, the, receive the connection. And then we do a simple TCP client, run that. And it's all happened wonderfully. So we waited to receive the connection. The client, client here, you know, uh, connected to the server and said hello from client and the server received the message, hello from client and sent back, echoed that back to the, back to the client and it said thank you for your message, hello from client. That's the reply from server, that's this little bit here. So the thing to remember is you just got to right click on the, um, right click on the ones, the ones you want um, to run. So to, if you want, there's a more sophisticated version here as well. So we've got the echo server. 
and you can have a little, little look, at, look at the source code if you want. And that's again waiting to receive the connection. And what this one does is you can, it reads data from the user, so hello there, for example. You send that, it sends that to the server and echoes it back and keeps running, keeps running, keeps running. Let's just shut that down. Right. And once the client shots, it throws an exception when, uh, when it loses the connection. And there's also, just to finish this off, there's a message server there which just shows you how to use the object, reading and object writing stuff. All right. So I so said the output, it's waiting to receive connection. Once it's received the message, it tells you what the message is and echoes it back to the client, which then says, thank you for your message, hello from client. Dead easy. So a few issues I just sort of talk through now. So you may have to explicitly allow socket com communication, even if it's within a single machine. Certainly, if you're trying to connect to an odd socket from outside a machine, it might just block it. Um, so firewall, if you have problems with this, first place to look is the firewall. Um, you should be able to add rules. Um, the, the laboratory machines should enable you to disable, should allow you to disable the firewall. So, um, but if you're having this problem, use ping. I mean, you guys must know about ping, right? But you just type ping with the uh, IP address you want to reach. And so if you can ping the machine, that means you, you should be able to, you know, you've got a good chance of being able to open a, use sockets to communicate with it. At least it's a good start. It means you haven't got the IP address wrong or anything like that. If a port's already in use, um, you're also going to get problems. You're going to get this java.net bind exception. Exception call, we're trying to listen on port, blah, blah, blah. Address already in use. Um, the first place to look for this problem is, is your own code, because maybe you've got, like, you've got your, one of your clients or servers already running on that machine that's already using that socket, in which case you're going to get this exception. So first check your own code, but then if you think it might be some other code, I'll well, just show it in here. You can use um, netstat, which tells you the, uh, if you do netstat-a, it tells you all the, all of the processes and the ports that they're listening on. So if I got this error, error exception call, we're trying to listen to port, blah, 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 I type netstat-a, and then I t it tells me that I've already got a process that's listening on this port. So then, you know, obviously I, I need to choose a different port or shut that process down. Um, I said next lecture we'll talk about threads, um, but you've got a, you've got the problem that you've got this server, like blocking call on the server waiting for a client connection, and if you want to handle multiple connections or you know do things in a sort of more, if you're doing a proper game that has multiple multiple users interacting on a single server, you're going to need to use multiple threads. So I'm going to explain how you can do multiple threads to multiple clients um, in a later lecture. Okay, so that's like a little bit of an overview of how you do TCP socket programming, and I'm going to go into UDP socket programming. So UDP is based around datagrams, these independent self-contained messages the center of the network whose arrival, arrival time, and contents not guaranteed. We've got three classes here. We've got a datagram packet, a datagram socket, and a multicast socket. So the packet's the client side, um, and we create that packet, uh, datagram packet from a byte array up to uh, 65... 507 bytes, so you build a packet, and the packet can, has the address built into it, and then you just fire off that packet, and then you know it'll be received by uh, the you know the IP address, the process listing on that particular port. So we've got a message, um, just a string. So we get the get the bytes from that, and then we build a packet from those bytes. Um, so we build a new packet, and then we create a socket. But it doesn't have an address or port because we've already built, we built the address and the port into the packet. So the packet contains everything it needs. It's like a little postcard containing all the data with the address on, with the address on it. So we just create a datagram socket and send that packet on that socket. On the server side, we create a buffer, which is like a byte array um, to receive the, um, receive the packet. So we create the packet um, using this buffer. And then we create a socket uh, listing on a particular port number here. And we have a blocking call to receive the packet. Once it receives the packet, um, the data that's sent is copied into this buffer array, into this packet. So we created this packet. So once we receive a packet, that packet contains the data we've received. And then we can do things like packet get data, packet get length, and so on and so forth. 
No persistent connections, um, but the packet itself, as we saw when we sent it, has the information about where it came from. So if we want to know where the packet's from, we can do packet get address or packet get port. And this is how you can maintain uh, your own persistent connections if you need to, but it doesn't itself su support this functionality. <coughs> it's a little simple UDP client. Again, you've got the source codes. I'm just going to focus on the main functionality. So here we have uh, the internet address, the message, the message bytes. We build our packet, give it an address um, and a port, and then we just send it off using a datagram socket. And then this is waiting for the reply here. So we create a buffer, create a packet using that buffer, and block here until we receive. Once we receive a packet, it'll, uh, this packet can contain the data we want, and we can fish it out. And same on the server side. So again, I'll focus on that. So create a data RAM socket. Again, we're listening, receiving a packet here. And then we can, um, then we echo the fact that we've received a packet. And then we build a packet and send it back to the client. So, so this gives the output. You know, well, I'll show the demo first, then we'll, we can get back to that. OK, so this is the. Um, Simple UDP clients and simple UDP server. So we'll run the server first, waiting for the client to connect, and then we'll run, run the client. And so it's a very simple program. It waits for the client to connect and says, message received, hello from UDP client, and it sends the message back to the client. It says, message received, UDP server packet received. So nice and simple. So yeah, we get waiting for the client, and once it's received the packet, it says that it's received the packet, and then it echoes it back to the client. Nice thing about UDP is it supports this multicast functionality, and you have these special IP addresses on the, on the network that are used for groups. And then you can uh, broad, you just send, a, send your packet to the multicast address, and then other, other processes on the network can listen for those multicast packets. You can just join the group to receive the messages. So you have the multicast socket instead of a standard, standard datagram socket, whatever it is. And then you get the address of the group if you need to know the IP address. And then you can create a packet and send the packet to the group. And then to listen, to listen for packets that are sent to the group, um, you just get the, get the group, group name. You can join the group then and receive packets that are sent to that group. So it's a bit like a topics where you can subscribe to topics or subscribe to email lists, something like that. So put all the example code that I've, sent you, I've shown you um, up on the class website. You don't need any jar files. You can just run it. It's standard Java. And if you any, want any uh, more sort of introduction to this kind of stuff, then the Liang book, uh, chapter 31, um, has you know, a lot of stuff on this explaining TCP UDP programming. So this lecture talks about how you can use sockets to communicate between programs um, and, and different, that can run on the same or different computers. I personally think that this is the best choice uh, for Mini Project 2, and I'll give you the most support for this. So we have some lab sessions on UDP and TCP pro programming. Um, the next lecture, we're going to talk about threads. Um, so if you want to use a server to communicate with multiple clients, um, it's going to be a lot easier using threads um, because of these blocking calls that they have, and that's what we're going to talk about next.